My name's David Harris, and uh, I think I'm the 19th president of Union College. That's why we're here. <laughs> so I'm really, really excited for this weekend, um, but particularly excited for this session. Um, and I'm excited because um, it, it's an opportunity to engage this community in what I see as one of the most important issues of our time. Um, it's an issue, and I talked with my old friend Scott about this and with the rest of our panel, but it's something that affects all of us, but we don't do a very good job of talking about it. Um, I think sometimes because we maybe bring the wrong frames to it. Um, it's a little too scary sometimes to talk about, but it affects all of us. And so what we're going to do this evening is talk about this whole issue. And this issue is what? It's constructive engagement. For those of you who were able to be at the Q&A earlier today, I talked about it a little bit in response to a question about free speech. And what I said at that time, um, and I knew it was a little provocative, and some people might think, wonder if they heard me correctly, I said I'm not a proponent of free speech. What I said is that um, on college campuses, I'm a proponent of constructive engagement. And what I mean by that is we're a learning environment. And you don't learn if one person stands up and yells and then another person stands up and yells. That's not how learning occurs. You learn if one person talks, the person asks questions, you have a discussion, you engage in a constructive way. And so at an educational institution, at least, that's what we ought to strive for, which is something beyond free speech. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. How do we do this? And we're going to talk about it in the academic symposium, not only from theory, from research, but we also want to talk about it in practice. So what are people? Um, doing in the trenches um, that seems to work, that seems to not. What can we learn? And I think one of the lessons that comes from this is that all of us, I think I speak for the panel, and they can correct me later if they want to, but I think we all struggle with this. I'll just say, as a faculty member who studies these areas, you know, I struggle with it when I taught classes on race, poverty, and equality, how to get people into these conversations and truly engage them in a deep way in the classroom. So we'll talk about that today. Um, the way this is going to work is Scott and I are going to have a conversation to kick it off for the first 20 minutes or so. And then I'll ask the rest of the panelists to join. And then there'll be ample time for questions and, and answers uh, with a conversation with the audience. So please be thinking of your questions. Then afterwards, uh, we have a dessert reception over here. And um, there's cookies. That's how Maya had a cookie. So we've got cookies over here. Are they all right? And we've got drinks. And so at the end, uh, we can have that and have some more conversation. So Scott Page. Um, Scott, thanks for joining me. Happy Real to be excited. Yeah. Um, so Scott, I'll read this because I can never remember. Um, Scott is uh, he's a, the Hurwitz Collegiate Professor of Complex Systems, Political Science, and Economics at the University of Michigan. Now, one thing you should know about the University of Michigan is everybody seems to have two or three offices and two or three appointments. Um, but Scott has a particularly interesting set of appointments, and we'll talk about what's a nice guy like him with these appointments doing talking about something like diversity. Um, how does that fit? So I've known Scott since I was a faculty member at uh, Michigan in 1996, joined Michigan. We were in a MacArthur Foundation Research Network together, and always found Scott incredibly engaging, insightful, and uh, really pushing on some of the most important topics of our day. So excited that uh, he uh, agreed to come out here and um, have this conversation. So welcome. Thanks. So Scott, let's start it off. In your book, um, not the most recent one before, you say that you've given lots of talks around diversity. Right. And you know, there's five things you cover. So what are those? Yeah, so typically, just as background, so I'm, a, ooh, I'm trained as a mathematician, as a game theorist. And I give a lot of talks on diversity. And the, I think what happens is when I walk in rooms, people have certain expectations. So they expect it's going to be about sort of the normative case or the historical case. And I'm going to make a more positive case. I'm going to make, just talk about the pragmatic benefits of diversity. It's also the case that it's going to be um, using kind of like math and logic and models as opposed to historical examples, right? Which I think people catch this people off guard. And I think it's going to be hopefully fun, right? It's going to be kind of lighthearted, right? It's going to, and and um, I think that really catches people off guard. I think it, people expect it to be sort of a heavy conversation as opposed to an engaged conversation. And I think that that's, um, 
I think it's been good for me. It's also been good for a lot of rooms. And one of the things that my sons, I have two uh, teenage sons, one's 18, one's 16, and what they say all the time is that people are forced to go hear our dad speak. <laughs> you know, so I think what's, the other thing that's different about me and most diversity speakers is most diversity speakers get to speak to the choir, right? So people who want to come here, diversity speaker. Most of the time I'm in rooms I get to, I'm talking to people who are kind of forced to come in and hear me, right? So speaking to the anti-choir. Because there are people who think that, you know, they don't believe in this. In fact, one of the best-selling books on the New York Times um, bestseller list this week is called The Diversity Delusion. And basically saying that, you know, all this implicit bias stuff and all this stuff, is just it's not real and it's ruining the meritocracy. And so what I try and do is sort of open up a conversation that makes people think about this sort of in a different way than they have before. And talk a little about, you mentioned, you know, the choir, the anti-choir. Yeah. So it's funny. One of the things Scott asked me before we started, and I'm too new to be able to really help him, yeah. but it's a question I always ask when I'm talking about some of these topics is, who's here? Yeah. What audience is in front of me today? Yeah. And talk a little about some of the folks you see and how you engage them. In yeah, so it's been a really wild ride. So I wrote this book called The Difference about a decade ago that was really kind of like a mathematical book about why diversity works. So just a little bit of background. I'm a professor of what's called complex systems. So people ask, what are complex systems? So complex systems are things that consist of diverse entities, you know, like people or ants or nations, right? And they interact in what we call a contact structure and network. So it's not like everybody's in the same room. You've got friends and, you know, neighbors and that sort of stuff. And you care, you're influenced by what other people do. So when David takes an action, I'm gonna to respond to that. So think about just even like the clothes you wear. Elementary school clothing choices aren't a complex system. Like you can go in a Spider-Man outfit, you can wear a suit, nobody really cares. But middle school, holy cow, right? You know, you're wearing the wrong thing in middle school, you may have to come home, you feel something in your tummy and come home at lunch or something, right? So middle school clothing choices are complex, elementary school aren't, and then when you get older now, doesn't matter again, right? It's kind of great. So middle school is a lot like international relations. So what's interesting is that I was in this, uh, <laughs> so I was in this field of complex systems. I was a professor at Caltech. I'm what they call in Michigan a spousal hire. So they were, Michigan was hiring my wife, and so I was um, coming along for free. And the dean at the time, Pat Gurren, who'd been the lead person in the Supreme Court case, I come in and she says, we're happy to have you here, and I just, just want to say one thing. And I'm like, great, what's that? And she said, you're wasting your life. And I'm like, Okay. That was your dean. That was my dean. That was my dean, right? That's why she was the dean. And uh, I said, would you care to fill me in? Because I'd like to know why I'm wasting my life. She goes, well, you and your people, and she meant here the complex systems people have all these like mathematical theorems and papers and scientific analysis showing that diversity, the world is now complex, and in a complex world, diversity has all these functional properties, right? Diversity leads to better solutions. It makes things more robust. It leads to more accurate predictions and all this stuff going on. And you're writing these papers in this little autocatalytic set of other people citing each other's papers, and nobody understands it, but you pointy-headed people writing math. And meanwhile, the whole other side of campus is making these sort of normative arguments, right? So this is the one you know, sort of thing that's different. Like you, there's a whole bunch of scientists basically saying, look, diversity makes systems better in a lot of ways, and also can make them sort of more fragile. And you're not sharing that with the rest of society. And I said, so why am I wasting my life? Why not everybody else? And she says, well, you're the first person I met in this area that doesn't know a lot more about his shoes than my face. <laughs> I'm like, what? She goes, basically everybody else I've ever talked to who does this is looking like this. And she goes, you actually seem like you would be okay in these spaces. But it's true, I mean, I mean Dave and I talk about this a lot, like, but there's some tough spaces, right? When you're in audiences that people who don't, you know, especially like you know, I was down at MD Anderson Cancer Center this summer, you don't get to be at MD Anderson, which is like the top cancer research center in the world, unless you got all A's in middle school, all A's in you know, college, great MCAT scores, you went to some top medical school. And so to say to them, it's not a meritocracy, they're like, wait a minute, no, 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 I should hire someone just like me because I'm good, right? And that's, I think, a really hard place to get for a lot of people. And, it's, and just to, to add a little context, um, and, and Scott alluded to it, let me just elaborate, we were at Michigan when the Gratz and Grutter affirmative action cases were going right. through the Supreme Court. My time right. was exactly the same period of time. Right. And so this was a really big issue on our campus at the time, as we were trying to figure out as a campus what we felt about these affirmative action cases in higher ed and what arguments would hold sway. Yeah, and it's also funny because the, the world has changed in a way. So one of the arguments I, I throw out all the time is if when you're doing something simple, this is kind of a, a paradox, you actually want to hire by ability. So in northern Michigan logging camps, and I'm sure in upstate New York logging camps, 
when they'd bring people in for a day and they'd see how many trees you could chop down, and that was your ability, right? So if David can chop down 14 and I can chop down 11, they should hire David. They'd also count your teeth, because you had to have enough teeth to eat meat to chop down trees the next day, right? <laughs> And so it's kind of like, instead of like a verbal and a you know, quantitative SAT score, it was like a trees plus teeth equals ability. And, and that worked really well, and whoever scored highest on that was the best logger, right? But the thing is, is that, and that was, used to be true like in 1950, 1960 in the academy, right? It made sense to hire people into the best schools because they were learning from the best professors. Now the notion of best is ill-defined for the following reason. There's just so much more knowledge. So I was visiting a friend of mine at UCSF in neuroscience, 60 some thousand papers were written in neuroscience last year. So he hires a postdoc from Nebraska who's great, and then he thinks, wow, I should hire another postdoc from Nebraska because she was great, he'll be great. Then he realized he's gonna have read the same 200 papers of those 60,000. I need somebody who's read a different 200 papers. And so the reality is once the space of things you know can get incredibly big, right, it's just meaningless to start describing one person as kind of like smarter than another person. Instead, what you want to do is you want to think about like what tools, what interests, what knowledge bases, what perspective, what ways of thinking, what interests do people have? And you want to fill rooms with people who sort of have different toolboxes, different ways of thinking. And when you fill rooms with those people and those people engage, you get somewhere. And I think what, you know, in talking to David, it's just a, it's a huge honor to be here. I think he's going to do an amazing job. And I think one of the things David wants to do is make Union College a place where that engagement takes place. And it can only be constructive if you've got people with different toolboxes in the room. So let's, let's talk about, so one of the things um, people often don't articulate is what we mean by diversity. Yeah. You can have right. a whole conversation about diversity, right. and at the end you think, by the way, what were you talking about? <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. That's not something completely different from right, what right, you right. were talking about. Right, so right, right. In, I've you know, read your work, so yeah. talk a little bit about what do you mean, and you've sort of hinted at it, but what are you talking about here? Yeah, so, in, so there's a lot of different ways to talk about diversity, right? And what, when you look at the work, the sort of more scientific work on team performance and group performance and organizational performance, it focuses on cognitive diversity, differences in how people think of the world, world, right? So when we say different perspectives, like I was just at NASA two weeks ago, and they literally mean like Cartesian coordinates, you know, like X, Y, and then polar coordinates, like I think, and they, those literally are different perspectives. And mathematicians will talk about different mathematical perspectives. In computer science and in psychology and organizational theory, they'll talk about people having different heuristics, different sort of problem-solving tools. And next week I go to the Congressional Budget Office and we were talking about like what are the different like models that people have. So people are just trained in different models. Or David is a, and we, we used to joke about this, he's trained as a sociologist. So sociologists think that you really don't have any choices. You have to play these roles in society, right? I'm trained as an economist and I think people just choose what they want to choose, right? And um, so you bring these sort of different frames. And so one of the great things about a college campus, and this is I think one of David's points about sort of free speech, is what we try to do is we coach people up like, you know, here's how a sociologist thinks about these things. Here's how a psychologist thinks about these things. Here's how an anthropologist thinks about these things. And you have discussions about, so if you think about, like, we have a massive um, racial wealth gap in the United States, right? Whites have an average $110,000 in wealth. African Americans have, like, $10,000 in wealth. What are the causes of that? Some are psychological. Some are economic. Some are cultural, right? And you're only going to get at that through, through showing lots of perspectives at it. Now, when most people talk about diversity, they mean identity diversity, differences in race, gender, sexual orientation, <laughs> religion, those sorts of things. The thing is, those things, again, if you look at sort of the empirical data, those things also correlate with team performance if the group functions well. But the thing is, those things also map to perspectives, right? So I grew up, if you read the book Hillbilly Elegy, then you know pretty much everything about me. Um, <laughs> You know, so I grew up in that place. David grew up in Philly. He grew up in a different space. So where you grow up, who your friends are, um, determine a lot about how you think about the world. And that's not just some, like, it, I think people used to just say things like that, but now we have so much data showing that to be true. So, for example, if you go to Amazon or you go to Google and you talk to them, they can tell your race, age, they can tell all your identity characteristics by your purchasing behavior, by the websites you visit, by the books you read. And so the thing is, what we fill our heads with is a function of who we are from an identity perspective. And so therefore how we think correlates, I don't, I'm not, it's not an essentialist argument. It's not because right, like, right, you know, right, right. but, it's, but it's, it's more of a sort of a cultural constructed argument. Like who you become is so much a function of who you are, right? Who you become sort of cognitively is a function of sort of who you are from an identity perspective. So, uh, to, so are you saying that diversity is always good in teams? No, so this is what's kind of, you know, so it's, it's there's a lot of, this is the thing we're trying to, people are trying to figure out. So there's a big movement of people called, um, in this field, called collective intelligence. Like how do you start um, good collectives? There's a wonderful book out by Tom Malone at MIT called Superminds, where he talks about like, you know, how do you get groups that work really, really well? And the first studies that they showed, it, it turned out like that you wanted to have like 
70% women and 30% men. Those were kind of the best teams, right? But then it, it turned out that it, the gender effect kind of went away when you realized you just need people who look people in the eye and can read facial expressions, right? Because that actually correlates with gender as well. And so there's been, there's been these big studies now, and again, social science, David can speak to this. One of the great things about a place like Union, which has a strong engineering department, you know, school as well as liberal arts, is that social science has changed. Like, so when, when we were trained, a study might have an N of 200, might, or you, know, you might have 30 undergraduates in a lab or do one case study. Now, you can run, you can scrape the web and get, look at millions of things. So Brian Uzi at Northwestern, who you know, we both know, has downloaded, looked at every single paper ever published, 24 million papers, right? And what you find is that, hold everything else constant, just let somebody else be from a different school, like God forbid I switch a Michigan co-author for an Ohio State co-author. But that's a, a fake experiment, because no one, space that's a safe space for me to say, say it here. That's, <laughs> that's right. But the, uh, but the thing is, is that there's a 10% chance that I'd get increased chance that I would have a hit paper, if you define it by having 100 citations. Right? So it's, there's a little bit just a 10% bonus just by working from a different school. Why? Because they read different papers, they do different stuff. So what the evidence shows that NIH did a huge study, again, looking at kind of every biomedical research paper I've written, what you find is there's a single peak in diversity, right? So you, if you have no diversity, you don't do the well as you do, add more diversity, you do better and better and better, but then it kind of falls off a little bit. But, but this is where it becomes an open question. This is where it becomes management. This is where it boils down to leadership, right? If you just throw diverse people in a room, it's a mess, <laughs> right? And so the bonus, the, my most recent book, the diversity bonus, the bonus from diversity seems to be getting larger over time. That's probably because the world's getting more complex. Mm -hmm. And the size of the groups that you can manage is getting better because we're figuring out. So one of the reasons, so Pat Gurren and the people at Michigan who really pushed the Gruder case, one of their points is, this is where you do it. The reason you want union to be diverse, the reason you want your children to go here and your children's children and your cousins and nephews and the people you care about is because you want them to be in a, in a place where they can learn to engage with people who think differently. Because those skills, those sort of, like my friend Uma Jayakumar calls this diversity human capital. The ability to work in diverse groups is just an incredibly important skill moving forward over you know, the next 50 years. And the people who can do that are gonna you know, change the world in a really positive way, right? So, we're, so we have to, I have to control myself because we have yeah. limited time. And but usually we have barbecue and beer when we're talking, it goes on forever. So, it's, <laughs> so this is, a, we're both like really constrained. So um, one of the things that, I'm gonna go back to the, the composition of groups yeah. that you've talked to. So I've talked to a range of groups and, and my most challenging group, I'd say, is trustees. I haven't talked yeah. to trustees here yet, so I'm not saying about you guys. Mm -hmm. But at some other schools, on some of these topics, that's sometimes a challenging group. You've talked to groups yeah. that are far less in the choir. Yeah. And so do you find that through your work, which I find quite compelling, yeah. you're able to get them to see this, or do you find that you know you really can't, yeah. can't break through? It's, so I was with a Fortune 500, like the CEO and the, the leadership, and I said, you know, define, I, and this was a bit of a setup, because I knew what the answer was gonna be. I said, so what's the, Define your culture in one word. This person said, meritocracy. And I said, I'm looking at 12 white guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said, you know, look at the 12 white guys here. And he goes, uh, our Indian woman is sick. <laughs> right? Which, and every, no, and, and he realized this, and he's like, he said it, and the, to his great credit, he goes, oh my God, we're not a meritocracy. I mean, it just hit him, right? And, but then there's other places where, like, you know, doctors, like, doctors and lawyers are probably the toughest crowd, because you say, they'll say, we're a meritocracy. And they'll have this belief, you know, and, or, you know, Bridgewater, the Ray Dowell case, you know, place just up the, um, the, the investment firm, right? They, um, they believe, like, we're hiring the best, right? And there's this notion that, like, you feel like, you know, you know, you went to Wesleyan, you got a Harvard MBA, right? You also got a Yale JD or something, right? You're just like me, I'm the best, you're the best. And I think it's very hard sometimes to convince people that, um, that someone who thinks different, you know, someone trained in a different place, right? Because high achievers are the hardest to sell on this, right? Because they feel like they've made it, and they typically have made it because they're good, right? right. But the thing is, but there's other types of good. Right. And I think with, with lawyers, it's, this is one that I, you know, I, anytime I get a chance to talk to lawyers, I try to, or the Department of Justice, because it's, I don't think we want people, you know, writing laws and adjudicating laws 
who all went to the same schools. Right. Right, I think people, you want people, as you know, Nancy Cantor, you know, friend likes to say, like, you want people who put their head down in pillows in different places, who know communities. Because the people who interact with the law, except for insider trading, <laughs> typically aren't people from like the suburbs of Connecticut who went to Yale, right. right? And so you want people who understand those communities writing the law, and the law would be stronger and better if, if people from those communities, you know, your community, my community, right. were judges. Last question before we get to our panel, and because I'm mindful of our time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're not an independent consultant, you're a faculty member. So yeah, you're yeah, yeah. teaching. Yeah. How does this work you've been doing affect what you do in the classroom? How you run a classroom and so forth? Yeah, so the, the two ways this affects the classroom. The first one is, is that like, again, growing up kind of like a, a hick. So when I got to, I went to the University of Michigan undergrad, um, a place called Yankee Springs, Michigan, where we had to drive like 30 miles to, go to a stoplight for driver's training and someone would get out and someone else would get in, right? <laughs> and, um, and so it didn't occur to me until like after I was doing this stuff that people didn't think I was a hick. I thought when I was presenting to my undergrads that like they just thought, here's some hillbilly from Yankee Springs, Michigan who's a professor, right? But instead they saw me as like a, like a real professor. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and so, stalks myself. Shot, yeah, I no, don't, like, like, you know, I was a, uh, what's, you know, passing or something, right? The, uh, and so I, so one big change I made like three years ago is I, you know, I kind of tell my personal narrative fairly early in the term to the undergraduates because there's a lot of kids in the classroom who I think see me and see the professors as a long way um, from where they are. So there's a wonderful uh, piece in, uh, I think, The Chronicle by Armando Penichega, who's from the diversity person at the Mellon Foundation that he published today, just talking about one of the big reasons for the pipeline issue in faculty is because people see faculty as so different from them, right? So underrepresented students, poor students, first-gen students see them as so different. So, so that's been the one big change. The other big change that I've made is, is, try, is really trying to encourage them to stop thinking about achievement and think more in terms of sort of building skills and tools. You know, so you're at, you're at a university where there's all these people who can expose you to all these amazing ideas, right? Yeah, and, and yeah, there's gonna be a grade point average, but in the long run, you're better off learning something new and getting a B right, right. than not learning anything and getting an A, right. right? And one of the things that's, the data may set us free here in the sense, so if you go, Google gets three and a half million applicants a year, right? And they run what they like to call a BAR, a big blank regression on that thing, right? And what they know is if you take harder classes, you perform better, right? And so it, at some point, this will filter back in, right? At some point, the students will just be, you know, they'll find out, wow, Google's hiring the person with the 3.7, not the person with the 4.0, because the person with the 3.7 took a hard math class, or stretched herself and took an anthropology class, or took organic chemistry, even though she was majoring in, you know, women's studies or something, right? So the, that is, that is coming through. They're, they're finding the fake four points. And, um, and that's good, because I think at the end of the day, if you want to make a difference in the world, and if you want to do something positive, you know, the uh, Maxine Hong Kingston, who's famous for writing the book The Women Warrior, talks about you know, that what, what's really important is taking these, out, these ideas out in the world and making it better. And so during the time you have at a place like this that's filled with ideas, right, I get really impressed with my students, you know, whether you're at Michigan, whether you're at Union College, wherever you are, grab as many as you can, engage them, think about them, and make them yours so that you can make a difference. So here's your exit question. Um, yeah. Optimistic or pessimistic on these issues in our society and our understanding of them? Oh, I'm totally optimistic. I know, the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, because, <laughs> no, because, like, no, because I get to interact with the people, the, even the people who are sort of against this yeah. in a way, right? When they, when they get in meaningful situations where there's things that they care about, mm -hmm. Um, they see that they really benefit by having diverse people in the room, right? And so once you have a shared sense of mission, like so if you go to NASA, there's not that many issues about this because they're just like, they're trying to get people to Mars, you know? And so, but if you go to Molex where they're making great computer cables, it's a lot harder, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that when we have a shared sense of mission, I see these issues just disappear, right? Because you look past the identity thing and you think about how can this person help me, right? How can it help us do what we want to do? Yeah, yeah so I'm super optimistic. Excellent. And then one of the things I think about is, I think you built the house in Ann Arbor, right? 
And we did. And that's one of the places I think about this, is building that house. Yeah. You know? The last thing you need is 50 carpenters building your house. Yeah. You have some plumbers, some electricians, some roofers, and they gotta be able to talk to each other. Right. right? Or this house is not going to work. Yeah. And so in a simple sense, that's some of what you're No, asking. and the guy, we just remodeled, and the guy that remodeled my house has a, who's like one of my people, he has a beard, one of those rat tail beards that go down there, and he races Harleys on weekend. And I would follow these Harley races on the weekend, one of my friends is like, Scott, do you really follow Harley races on weekends? I said, yeah, because if he crashes, I gotta find another builder. <laughs> you know, so it wasn't, uh, wasn't, it was like really just pure self-interest at that point. Excellent, so Scott, I wanna thank you for kicking off this right, conversation. No I wanna thank you for hopefully, folks are really helping us think about these issues in a slightly different way from, you know, if you're a good person, you think this, if you're a bad person, you think that. Um, you've had lots of experience with lots of groups, so thank you for doing that. And I ask now the rest of the panelists to join us up here. So I think you have a program that gives you bios of folks. Um, and so I'm not going to go through the whole, all the bios. I will just say, um, really, ex well, I guess this is the idea about diversity of perspective. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, really excited to have this group of people here. I think there's very little redundancy. Um, they're approaching these issues as uh, scholars, practitioners um, from different places. So I think together we'll get some interesting insights. Um, we have with us uh, Deirdre Hill Butler and Andrew Morris, two faculty members here at Union, um, whose work touches on these topics and who also teach courses, different types of courses, in which they have to figure out how to navigate some of these issues with their students. Um, Kirsten Lodo, an old friend of mine, not that old, we're not that old, but, but these are friends coming in for inauguration, uh, who runs Lyft, um, and really just, I think, doing amazing work and really a role model for students who want to think about making a difference. Um, I'm gonna have to almost give away your age, but Kirsten founded this organization called Lyft in her dorm room at Yale, and um, now is uh, doing the right thing and stepping back from it, having a new CEO after 20 years of leading it, and having a huge impact in cities across the country on opportunity, on an anti-poverty effort. Um, and we'll talk with her about some of the ways in which she engages these. Uh, Rona, where's Rona Asiati? A um, student here I've got a chance to know just in the last few weeks, and uh, I think we'll also bring, I know we'll bring really many different interesting perspectives to it, and at the Q&A earlier today, I talked about athletics, and that's one of the issues uh, we look forward to, and Laura Munkris um, with our Minerva program. Um, the Minerva program is one of the ways at Union that we aim to take what happens in the classroom, that academic mission, and have it continue outside of the classroom. Minervas are the vehicle, one of the vehicles for this, and of course, these issues will therefore come up in the whole Minerva system. So thank you for being with us this evening. Let me start with you, um, and I'll just go through a little. <laughs> so um, you've been engaged on issues of race and equality uh, in research and teaching and service. I know you're very involved with a number of students uh, here at the school. Um, you hear Scott talk about these issues. I wonder what resonates uh, what do you, what's, what sort of, uh, is, is consistent with some of the things you've seen and what are some of the challenges you face in trying to get people to talk about these issues and make progress? Right. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the panel. Yeah. I think this is a, it's extremely timely. It actually always is timely to talk about diversity. Um, my experience, let me tell you a little bit about me, for those of you who don't, don't know. I am, um, I've been at Union, this is my 18th year, and I come from the New England area but I'm steeped in Africana studies, black studies knowledge. Um, I was mentored and, and taught by scholars who were activists who wanted to change and adjust the American way and, and even broader than just the America into making all people feel valued and, and important. And especially acknowledging that the black experience is a crucial part of, where black experiences are the crucial part of what all of us should know about and celebrate. And so I came to Union some 18 years ago um, with hired to really bring another breath and a level to Africana studies in my courses and in women and gender studies as well. And um, my home is sociology. And the classroom experience was kind of difficult because a lot of the students and on the Union um, campus 
didn't, hadn't really had professors that looked like me who were coming from an approach that wanted to learn about people outside of their experiences. And I can all, over my years, it's become a little less, and I'll, I'll use the word, a little less hostile. Um, and sometimes the experience was difficult for people to feel uncomfortable. When you think college is a time to get a little bit uncomfortable, right, and to expand yourself. And I think union is, is a place that has changed over the years that we are um, developing young minds to see the world in a broader way. And I, we, we have a, we, we, we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. So as director of Africana Studies, a pillar of that program is to have community engagement, to take students outside of just the classroom and to learn from the community folks we share spaces with. And so I've had experiences in courses where we've gone to the Hamilton Hill Art Center and learned from cultural activists. We've um, gone to places or had people come to campus to speak with us and work with us and, and learn from them and have a shared experience. And sometimes that's been a little bit, we've been hesitant in doing more of that. So on the personal level, my research and my teaching has really come from the knowledge of wanting people to respect other people who may not look or have the same experiences of, of, as they do. And I think that skill, and that complements what Scott was saying, that skill of learning a little bit outside of your own boundaries is something you can take with you outside of any classroom or getting any type of degree. So taking a risk, if anything, students of mine will say, your class was the first class where I felt uncomfortable and I took a risk. And I've often even gone so far as say, you know, this doesn't even really have a grade. Let's not even think about the grades. Let's think about what you're going to learn, what your tools that you're going to add to your tool set. And that shocks some students, but then they get into it after you work closely with them. So I feel as a privilege to be at a school like Union where I can form and facilitate experiences where people can take a risk. But I, I do have to say, there's been some pushback with that. But I think that's, that's ebbed and lessened to some degree. And I, th I think the students that will come through here, and even our colleagues and, our t and the experience that you can have on this campus can be, can be supported if you think about things in a different way. And that's what diversity is to me. It's not just having the physical look of people right. being in a different space, it's the risk taking and um, feeling uncomfortable but knowing that that's, that's building who you are in a larger way. Excellent, thank you. So one of the things that Scott talked about, uh, I think you said something like, when you just put a lot of people from, uh, a lot of diversity in the room, it's a mess. Yeah, 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 yeah. You gotta frame uh, it. Yeah. yeah. Unless she's sitting in front of it, then you <laughs> can <laughs> it. So no, it's true, right? I mean, you, it, it takes a lot of work, yeah. It's a lot of work, and it's, but I think couched in a social science humanities way, you can really frame things so you have constructive dialogues in a constant way. One of the things I learned from economists, and I think usually economists are learning from us, but one of the things I learned from economists <laughs> is the power of selection, right? right, right, right. talk a lot about selection. Yeah. You talk about causality or anything else. And you think about a lot of that in these classes. Who's taking these classes? A lot of the action may have already occurred at that point. Right. But so if I turn to Andy Morris, because your classes, maybe a little less than Deirdre's, um, might not be as obvious to students that they'll end up in some of these conversations, in part because it's a historical perspective. And so imagine maybe it seems less um, controversial, less scary, because we're talking about something 80 years ago. So talk about in, in your classes, how do these things work? Well, thanks, David, for sort of convening this. This is really cool. It's, I'm so excited for having you here and for the tone you're setting already. Um, I think this is a great conversation, and I'm really happy to be part of this. I thought I, I wasn't going to start out talking about this, but just listening to Scott giving your little biographical background and, and dear to what you said, I thought maybe I'd just add a personal anecdote before I talk about sort of what goes on in the classroom. Um, I'm from, I grew up in a small town in Vermont. Um, I somehow got into a competitive uh, undergraduate institution. I, I know I was not the smartest person there. I know I didn't have the highest SATs. At, sometimes I wondered what, how did I get in? Why was I there? And and I'm convinced that you know part of it was I was a diversity hire. And you might not think of that looking at me as sort of a run-of-the-mill white guy, 
but that sort of geographical diversity, the fact that I came from a you know, mid-sized public school and not one of the public schools outside of the super competitive Boston suburbs, New York suburbs, that kind of thing. And you know, I feel like if I added anything to that time when I was in college, I mean, part of it, I feel, was that the sort of wonder I had at the opportunity that I was given there and just that excitement of being like really pushed by these people that were so smart, you know, colleagues that had just gone to these great schools, um, but who also maybe were a little jaded by that experience, a little blase about the opportunities that they had now in college. And, um, and I, I think about when you talk about the sort of values of that sort of cognitive diversity and what all these different kinds of backgrounds can contribute. I, I really, I felt that was part of my own personal experience, and you know, and that's sort of the pathway that brought me here. But anyway, I mean, to talk about what we do, what I do in the classroom, um, yeah, I mean, history is kind of a sneaky way of getting at some of these uh, harder issues. I mean, I teach, I tend to teach 20th century U.S. history. Um, many of the things that are really, you know, hot button issues on campus, in society today. I mean, we can see them cropping up 100 years or so ago. But when you're able to work with students and, and approach things from, that are where you're a step removed, where it doesn't seem like your sort of elements of your core identity are directly on the line and directly being challenged, um, or that you have to defend them. I, I think it, 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 it eases the tension a little bit and there is a greater opportunity to take that risk of putting yourself in someone else's shoes and, and, and considering um, you know, whatever the dispute at hand is. So, you know, for instance, I mean, past couple of years there's been tons of social science research on uh, you know, just how tribal are partisan and political identities have become. I mean, it just, it just is a clear fact and, um, you know, how unique that is to 2016 to 2018, not entirely sure there's been periods of that before. But if you, if you go, for instance, and talk about the 1930s, and I teach a lot about that period, yeah, we had Republicans, we had Democrats, there were people that described themselves as liberals, they, were they would describe themselves as conservatives, but those categories clearly did not mean the same thing that they do in 2016, 2018. Um, and if you can start with that fact and, and, and bring students into that, then my experience has generally been you can, you can get at some of these, you know, contentious political issues. You can talk about political figures or you know, some particular piece of legislation, blah, 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 in a way that doesn't necessarily immediately cause people to think, well, I have to, you know, because I'm conservative, I'm a liberal, I have to defend or attack this. There's a little bit of leeway just because, again, we, you have the luxury of that being removed in time in a way sometimes I think that, you know, Deirdre as a sociologist or some of our friends, my colleagues who teach political science or economics are doing right in the here and now. I mean, it's just right there. There's no way to avoid it. So, um, and the same thing with, you know, sort of when you're talking about human sexuality or you're talking about race. I mean, all of that stuff was there a hundred years ago, um, but it often is, was raised in ways or with language that is so different from the way that we talk about it today, that again, I think it's, it's possible to, to start a conversation where people aren't, don't necessarily have their guard up as immediately as maybe you would if you came at it head on. Um, but that being said, you can then maybe sometimes coax people along to think about the way it reflects on these contemporary issues. And if, if I'm lucky, sometimes, um, you get people coming at and thinking about, you know, what's going on now in a slightly different way than maybe if you'd come at it um, head on. Um, and when that works in, in the classroom, in my classroom, and it does not always work, I mean, I, I feel like I, I fail at it more often than I succeed, um, it's, it's really fun and wonderful. Um, 
On the other hand, I will say too, and this is sort of a, you know, a part of maybe David, the, your, you know, your focus, your mission here, and you know, to some of the students in the audience, I, I feel like sometimes we, the problem is not, it's not that we have too much argument and controversy in the classroom, it's that we don't have enough. Right, <laughs> that's right. That I would really like to see our students rise even more than they do to the challenge of, 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 of active, serious debate and engagement with each other, knowing that you're not necessarily gonna agree. And I know, even looking out in every class I have, there is a range, there's a range of people who look different, I know there's a range of people who think different, but it, we don't always get that sense in the classroom itself. And, and who knows, there's a variety of reasons. I think it's partly because our students are also, most of the time, very polite and considerate and don't want to argue with each other, or they don't want to hurt someone's feelings, so there's a sort of social aspect to that, which I totally get. Um, I think sometimes, too, the way that the social and intellectual life at Union sort of merge into each other, that it, it can feel risky sometimes to take a strong opinion mm -hmm. on anything for fear that that might blow back on you somehow outside of the classroom, I don't know. But I think that, I, I, I hope that maybe in part because we live in such, a, in, in such a political climate now that's so contentious, that we can find a way to, to manage that but, but, but activate our engagement in a way, channel some of those disagreements, those different perspectives, but in a way that's more constructive perhaps than it is playing out on a larger scale. Just to pick up on that, one of the things that back when I was in the classroom teaching on racial inequality, it was striking. I'd show students a bunch of differences by race, in poverty, in education, employment, and so forth. And we talk about, I'd say, so what are the explanations? Why are we seeing these? What did students never say? Biological differences. They never said it. I knew they were thinking it. I knew some of them had to be thinking it. So I would say it. Don't you guys, so you have to take that position sometimes and push them. And once you said it, maybe you open the door a little bit but that's the challenge on these issues, right? It's what they say later to their friends that they won't say in the classroom. Kirsten, so um, one of the challenges here as we're talking is, you know, if, if we buy, I do, I literally did on Amazon, yeah, right. buy Scott's argument. Two copies. <laughs> buy Scott's <laughs> argument um, about the power, importance of diversity in these particular situations. Um, there is this issue about how we pull this off. And as I said earlier, I love what you've done with Lyft. But part of what's so interesting about it is you are taking, in some cases, college students and trying to get them to understand the experiences of folks who are very different. So I know we saw that with some of the folks at Tufts when I was there who were working in Lyft. So what did you, what did you learn first, you, as being different from some of the people you were working with and how you could effectively understand their perspectives? And what have you seen from folks you've been trying to coach over the last 20 years? Well, so David talked about trustees, and we know each other because David was one of my trustees and board members, so he was my boss for many years, and um, uh, Union is just so lucky to have David. Oh, so thank you, for, thank you for having me here. Uh, so, you know, I think the most important way to build relationships across difference is the one that sounds the simplest but is the hardest to execute and it's that you actually have to get to know people. And uh, as the great lawyer and moral leader, I think of our time, Brian Stevenson, talks about this concept of getting proximate. Getting proximate and we do live in a society where we are, I mean, we are algorithmically filter bubbled into an echo chamber. I mean, it is astonishing how much we can in this moment of peak diversity, actually, never ever have to hear a different perspective or really get to know someone deeply. And so, you know, I think a lot of my experience in evolution at Lyft, but also figuring out how do you build that as a methodology in a service organization, as it were, is how do you figure out how to build deep, reciprocal, mutual relationships? We're an organization that prides ourselves on the idea that we're able to see families achieve 
great results in terms of economic progress and stability because of the power of the relationships that our coaches and our members, we don't call them clients, our members build. But how do you actually build relationships when typically if you think about most clinical settings, if you think about most community service settings and such, there isn't reciprocity. Y you have someone on one side of the table who is um, deemed to have the expertise, often holds the power, is kind of in the learning absorption mode, and someone else who's actually, if you think about the sheer nature of intake, or maybe even community programs where someone's going out to learn about the community, that person is sharing their life story, they're really giving a lot of themselves, they're making themselves really vulnerable, and it's not a two-way street. So one of the things we've codified at Lyft in our approach and service methodology is what I like to think of as radical reciprocity, which is to say if you're going to come into the organization on staff, like David experienced this as a trustee, but most importantly as a coach, you are in that first meeting with one of our members going to actually share a lot about yourself, your own motivations for doing the work, your own background, because that's the place from which real relationships start. And I, I really think what Scott said about even just the, the example of professors, just that little bit of sharing your own story to start to break down that sense of difference and how transformational that is. I mean, the, the results of that, you know, maybe that's not yet radical, but pushing for that reciprocity to get to know each other, everything starts to change and open up from there. It does feel, it feels really good to connect across difference. It gets, what is it, the Oxycontin, you know, all the happy, mm -hmm. you know, the happy chemicals flowing. It really, really does. And then from there, you really are in a better place to sit with the discomfort. There is uh, the People's Institute and others, you know, doing uh, racial justice work often talk about the notion of sitting in the fire. That, right, if you're going to do this work, there's a willingness, there has to be a willingness to sit with the discomfort, discomfort to get to that flywheel peak performance that I really do think always, always comes. But it's, it's much better if we can get to know other people and share a lot about ourselves. So we have a tradition called Why I Lift right. that anyone coming in, including a trustee, has to share. And it's not like on, on what's, what's your resume version of why you're compelled to do this service. It's deep down, what happened to you in childhood? Why did you do this? And, you know, th that would be the, the really interesting college, you know, yeah. I guess the, the difference of the 4.0 and such yeah. is kind of not the, not the resume version of you, but who are you really? What brings you to this work and how can we connect deeply? So bringing that into the context of campus community relationships, community service, and thinking about often kind of the difficult town gown challenges that we see um, feels like, you know, hopefully a takeaway I could offer um, in the work here. So when you think about the coaches over 20 years, over a number of cities, um, when it doesn't work, and it must be cases where it just didn't work, yeah. why didn't it work? What was the challenge in trying to get people to be able to connect with members? Well, so we believe that the families that we're working with, our members, they are the experts in their own lives. And I will say in the world of a lot of clinical work, that's the kind of revolutionary notion is that, you know, people are their, are the experts in their own lives. And so we're pretty strict about being overly prescriptive in defining a path for someone. And I think that's where, that's where things tend to not work out is I think if someone can't get over the idea that they know better than someone else what they should be doing in their life. Um, and that will play out if you see, you know, I, I think someone might come in who has a GED and hasn't completed post-secondary but has aspirations to have a career in medicine and such. And, you know, not everyone can get there to believe that that might be possible, even though we see all the time that there are pathways there. So I think there's a, there's, there's a mindset that people tend to self-select to some degree in, but that's where it's become the hardest. Uh, yeah. So to shift a little, so we've been talking about students. But um, no offense, my friends, we are far from our undergraduate days. <laughs> but we have an undergraduate with us. So Rona, um, not only are you an undergraduate here at Union, uh, you remember the basketball team? Um, you're an international student of sorts. Your time in the US a little bit before college, but most of your time in another country. Um, I talked this morning in the Q&A about athletics. And we talked about this in my office, and about the role athletics can play in this whole conversation. So I wonder if you just share your perspective uh, on some of these issues. 
Thank you, thank you. Um, I think um, it's beautiful just to just be here and hear all this, um, everything you are all saying here. Um, one of the things that I've learned so far being here is that um, on a team, it's because I've been on two in, um, organizational teams since I've been in the U.S., my Bergen Catholic High School basketball team and Union College right here. And um, it's just been, it's been an honor to be part of these kind of teams because I have learned from um, both the players and the coaches. Some of the things that I've learned from the coaches, they overlap um, with each other. And one of them is trust. They always say something, they say trust, care, commitment. Okay, so, um, so what I'm talking about here is um, just trust. You know, I, I feel like trust is um, a very important bedrock for us to have, for, um, to have constructive engagement with one another. Um, so I've been here for, um, I'll say, for almost four years now, and I've been on, I've been on different teams. So my the Bergen Catholic High School basketball team, we had, um, we had two other Italians, myself, and um, the rest of us, the rest of them were just, um, which were, it was, it's a predominantly, predominantly white school. And same year also, we just had myself and Tammy. Um, but in the sense of diversity, I would say it's a very di it's been very diverse being part part of these groups, you know, um, because we all have different ideologies. But if you show me a team that's able to bring um, all their different ideologies and put that at the door of the gym and then walk in and take on the team's goal and um, just pursue that, and I'll show you a team that's willing to compete and that a team that that stands a chance, you know. Um, so going further, I, I believe that um, the amount of time that we've spent together just being on the court, and um, something my coach said yesterday that really struck me, he said that it takes 40 hours to, to build a relationship with someone, you know, just face-to-face -face conversation, and uh, it takes a lot more by text, you know, but, <laughs> or by emails, you know. But um, if... We, we spent 200 hours on the court every season together. So at some point, there's got to be some communication, you know. <laughs> um, you have to know this person has my back, you know. And um, I was talking with you when I first met you, and um, I said that sports is in some way, it's some, in some little way, like the military. I, w I wouldn't say it's close at all, but, you know, you, have, you know someone else has your back. And um, that's what I feel. That's, what I, that's why I feel that we have a very, very um, unique opportunity to, to constructively engage with one another because this is a this is safe space that, that people look for, you know, to talk about certain issues, and we have it, you know. Um, I don't think it's being used enough. I don't think it's being harnessed enough because, um, I don't know, I think part of the reason is because we feel like um, there are groups on campus that already um, take on these roles and want to already talk about issues like this. But I feel like we can, we can do a little more with that, with the space that we have by ourselves. Um, something we always did in my high school is that we would always have, like before the season starts, we would always have um, meals and we'd talk after the meals, but we would have like a secluded place for just the guys to talk. And we'll share things about ourselves. People will talk about their hardships and people will talk about the heroes. You know, one thing that made me laugh during the thing, the, one of the sessions was someone said his hardship was trying to pick a college to go to. And I'm like, that's your hardship? <laughs> uh, that's, that's the thing that's bothering you, you know? Um, but what I learned from that, like you said, um, was that um, we got in uncomfortable situations and we grew from that. We learned more about ourselves. You know, and that made us vulnerable with each other, like you said. You know, it's something you also mentioned. You said being comfortable with the uncomfortable, that's one of the things that you want to um, try to um, create in this school. So um, I would say the opportunity is there for us to definitely have these conversations and we can, you know, we can make it better by just communicating with one another honestly, you know, just, yeah. thank you. And I just say, to pick up on that, I mean, the military, Band of Brothers, um, you know, when, I, when we talked about this and when you were talking here, it does sound a bit like a sibling relationship. Because you talked about, it's an interesting story that one of them, I hope it wasn't any of these guys, but one of your teammates was riding you a little hard. Uh, maybe he's here. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and the ways that you were able to talk with one another, um, and, and have follow-up that was different. Yeah. 
yeah. from what would have happened with somebody else. Yes. Yeah. I wouldn't mention his name, um, Kevin, but... Uh... <laughs> 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 yes, it's like, it's like the way I grew up in Nigeria and we had my siblings, I'm, I'm one of um, six kids, um, we, would, we, would, we would have clashes sometimes, you know, but then it would just happen that at dinner time we're all talking together and it's all just going on well. I feel like that, that's a natural, you know, communication of, that's the way we say sorry naturally to ourselves. But there is, we also need to have communications. We've talked, we've we sent messages to each other when we just, we have talked. Um, but one thing I know is that he wouldn't do anything to hurt me. I know he's my teammate. I know that he's trying to get the best out of me. You know, so that's why um, I was able to still, we're still, we're cool now, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting metaphor. It's interesting, I was saying earlier, it's interesting to think about what happens in these teams. I see some of my friends from Tufts and what we've dealt with at Tufts on some of these things as well and what lessons are learned and how we could possibly build across the broader community. So about building across the community, that brings me to you, Laura. So, um, and we talked, you were also a college athlete, so we were talking about the athletics part of it. But here at Union, um, in your key role in the Minerva program, I wonder if you might say just a little bit about Minerva and the goals for those, we have visitors here who don't know about it, um, but also how are you and your colleagues trying to bridge this gap? trying to use the time outside the classroom to pursue the goals that we've been talking about here and deal with some of the challenges that Scott and others have addressed. Sure. Thank you very much for having me. We're, yeah, we're really excited to uh, get the opportunity to talk about the Minerva program. It's one of the things uh, that makes Union a little bit different when I, we speak to a lot of groups who are coming, thinking about being, uh, applying to Union, coming to Union. It's one of the differentiators when they look at other colleges. And so the Minerva program is, is aimed at blending intellectual life and social life outside of the classroom. It's aimed at increasing faculty and student interaction outside of the classroom. We talk about, kind of, I think Scott mentioned that. And it's also just about diversifying the social opportunities on campus. And so um, I work with our seven different Minerva houses to do different programming. Um, and they range from purely social, you know, when the weather is nice, we'll see students barbecuing out back. And then we see things that are that are more intellectual. We see speakers and, and poets and authors and different people coming here to discuss with our students and our faculty and staff uh, to engage with, on different issues. And so I think the core of what, what we're talking about tonight is really embedded in the, in the mission of the Minerva program. Um, so some of the challenges that I think we face, uh, you have to look at it from almost two different, two different uh, sides. So we have the houses, right? So by houses, I mean the students and faculty member who are making decisions about what types of programs we're doing. So you all probably saw what was going on out on Rugby Field, right, social programming. We do a lot of social programming, and our houses are really excited about that. They're fun. Uh, it makes people feel good. It makes them happy and it makes people feel included. And the challenge comes is that our houses are a little bit nervous to put on programs that ask people to step into discomfort. You know, I think Andy sp speaks about this in class. They don't want to be wrong. They, they don't want to offend someone. They're, they don't want to be perceived as being biased in any way. And so they're, they're a little bit hesitant to, um, to put on or to engage with programs that kind of challenge people. And then from the other side of things, we also have our students, right? So our students are incredibly bright. They're taking challenging academic course loads. They're involved in all of the 200 clubs that, that were out on the field. They're in athletics, Greek life. Um, and so in their limited time, they can choose to opt in or opt out of the different things that are going up. On, on campus, and so it's a little bit different than the classroom where in the Minerva programs, they can, they can opt out if they don't like it, if it makes them uncomfortable, if it, uh, it kind of challenges their belief system, then with their limited time, why would they choose that? And so I think that that's some of the challenges that we face in the Minerva program. And so thinking about how do we fix this, right? How do we change this? How do we get people to kind of buy into what the Minervas are all about and what constructive engagement is, is all about? And I think it's, it's a bigger question. I think we, we hear the themes here among the panel. 
Um, but, you know, we've been talking about it. Our, our office is going through a transition. We're thinking about what does, what do the Minervas look like moving forward? And so that's why it's really exciting for us to be here today, to be having this conversation. You know, how do we engage faculty and just enhance what they're doing outside of the classroom so that it bleeds down, down campus into the, pre to the, uh, programming and residential spaces on campus. How do we onboard people, right? We just went through orientation with our first year students. We will do faculty orientation. We'll do uh, new employee orientation. So we tell people about the Minervas, but how do we remind them, you know, months, they're, they're overloaded with information. How do we come back and say, these are, these are places that you can come uh, to engage with people who are different from you, who, to have conversations uh, with people from different perspectives. And what's beautiful about the Minerva program is that everyone is a member, okay? Students, faculty, and staff are assigned when they come here, and it's, it's random, and that's intentional, because we want people to, uh, who wouldn't normally interact to meet and interact in, in those spaces. And so I think a lot of it starts with kind of what we're doing here, right? Yeah. Asking these questions, raising the profile, you know, it's kind of setting the tone for mm -hmm. this is what we do at Union. These are, this is a place where not only are different opinions uh, welcome, but they're really, really important for many of the reasons that have already been just stated. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So we are about at our time to open it up to questions. And so um, let's see if there are questions. I have one burning as well, so I will Hold tight, um, but if you don't step up, you're going to be subjected to me asking more, so know that. So, um, and I want to sort of say, one of the things I said earlier today is the definition, one of the definitions for me of a successful meeting, successful event, is that you don't walk out and say to your friend a whole bunch of things that you didn't feel like you could say in that room. Um, so in the spirit of constructive engagement, in the spirit of diverse perspectives, really hope that what you're thinking right now, right, you, what's burning but you're not sure you can ask, I hope you will. So with that, let me open it up. Oh, and there have microphones coming, if you wait. And I would also say, if you could just identify yourself and your connection to the, to the community. Yes, sir. I mentioned one of these things to you before. Yeah. Um, if you look at the statistics, we're pretty diverse. The uh, admissions operation has done a pretty good job. In that sense, if you look at the number of black students, number of Latino students, um, number of students from other countries, um, and uh, from that perspective, we do pretty well. But I wanna mention two things. One is what a student from another country said to me a couple of years ago. The student said to me, you know, American students, students from Union, they will be friendly to you, but they won't be your friend. That's a telling comment. The second one is that when I go to the cafeteria in Reamer, I will see black students, Latino students, but I won't see them sitting together generally at the same table, uh, except for the athletes. And they will be together. And I think, I'm guessing, the reason is that they're engaged in a common enterprise. And what I think we need to do is find ways to have students cross these boundaries because we marginalize people, like we marginalized that student from another country who said, union students will be friendly to you, but they won't be your friend. So we have to find a way not to marginalize people. We can marginalize them because they, are, they have a different sexual identity, uh, they might be disabled, they might be from another country, they might be black, they might be Latino, they might be Asian. This is not an easy thing to do. We need to make them part of a community. And the Minervas conceivably could do that. I don't know what the other means are yeah. to do this. Yeah. This is not easy, but we are not a healthy community from my point of view. And I, I know you care about this, and I know you're gonna work hard at it, and you need a lot of people to help you on this. Absolutely. And I'm retired, so I can't help. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just have. I would say, um, and, and I just start off and ask others. So Mary Pat McMahon's Dean of Students, sorry Mary Pat, at Tufts and a friend, and a year ago, um, we went somewhere that people wondered, had he lost his mind? On these issues, we went to learn at the U.S. Naval Academy. That's where we went. 
And why did we go to the US Naval Academy? It's what Jim said, it's what you heard Scott saying and others, because they have to figure this out. It's an extreme version of what you heard from Rona, because they know that six years down the road, their lives and the lives of the people under them may well depend on their ability to communicate effectively with people who come from a very different perspective and different walk of life. And asking the question, what can we learn? And how can we help students on a campus understand that they have a shared mission? And just one example that I like to try to use with some students who are um, quite progressive and think, I have nothing to do with these you know, right-wing students who want to be conservatives and so forth. I say, and here's some of my friend, you'll appreciate this one. I say, you know, somewhere down the road, when you have started this incredible not-for-profit and you're making change, you know who your donors are going to be? <laughs> it's probably not going to be the people like you who also have started not-for-profits, a little bit. But you have to figure out how to work with those people. So I think if we can find ways to help our students appreciate there's value. I think that'll be quite effective. Other reactions to Jim? Yeah, as an outsider, I was hearing a little bit at dinner, I know there's a strong Greek system. I'd be curious, is there diversity within that system? Is that a, is that a hot button issue? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> when you were talking about social connecting. It's not a hot, hot button <laughs> issue, but there has been growth. The mainstream Greek organizations have diversified, but I hear from some students of color who are in the, the predominantly white fraternities and sororities that they're ex now they, they've gained entry in the last 10 years, but they're seen as the add-ons and not central. Mm. And, and, and so, but 15, 20 years ago, they weren't, they weren't there. We, uh, there, there's been some of students of color who've brought on traditionally, um, black and Latino Greek organizations on the campus. And there's a push to do even more of that. But in the, tr in the history of those organizations, there's always been a welcoming spirit for those who aren't of that ethnic group to join those groups. So, and, and that's actually happened on this campus. So we have Alpha Phi Alpha here, which is the oldest black fraternity. We've had white members in that group. So, and it's been an open situation. So it's, it's not a hot button situation, but we still need to do some more work. Each, each organization, if, if, please correct me if I'm wrong, has a diversity chair within that. And I, I need to be fully, full disclosed, I'm a member of one of the historically black sororities, the oldest one, Alpha Kappa Alpha, and that doesn't have a chapter on, on the campus. So I'm aware of, of, like my colleagues, a lot of us are kind of anti-Greek, but then I'm in it, and, and, I, and <laughs> I'm in it and then out of it mm -hmm. at the same time, so I can understand that world but I can understand that it can be a barrier, but also a bridge. Mm -hmm. And I think we're working towards that with cross programs and understanding. And there's a lot of groups. Actually, we have, I'm not sure if Dr. Stiles is here, but um, oh, George yeah. is here. Okay, to talk about UNITAS as an organization that was started 20 years ago with their vision, Carl George and, and Twitty, to bring groups and bridging that. Um, for student groups who seem to be polarized, having, putting funding and concrete organization around that to open student dialogue and, and meetings of the minds. So there's, there's pockets of growth here in regards to diversity. It's, there, and it's been some change. We, have, we still have a long way to go. And conversations like this can lead to a lot more concrete work. So, yeah. Other questions? We've got our mic runners, Jason. If you identify yourself, appreciate it. Um, I have a question about economics for my students. Okay. Um, I was talking with a professor. Um, he was once here. And I was told that 15% is the number of students that might get a full scholarship Is your question what percent of students are on aid or need-based aid or full need-based aid? Well, or just more generally, what's the economic diversity guess, look like? I guess both. Okay. What, what percent would be a full scholarship? And I'm sure many get aid. Right. Um, so 
So, um, so uh, you know, the power of people with diverse perspectives and intelligence, Matt Malatesta sitting over here. So Jason, why Mike's, Matt, can, I can say something, but then Matt will send me an email later and tell me I blew it. So Matt, why don't you just, he won't, he's too nice. But if we can get Matt a microphone up here, he can, he can talk a little about the economic diversity we have uh, here at Union, the student population. Uh, so unions committed to meeting the full financial need of any student who's admitted to the college. So over half the students who come to union get need-based financial aid. And I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it's probably 18, 20 percent of students are getting full scholarship. And all in, it's about 70 grand to go, go to college here. Um, so our, our resources, you know, we're, you know, in a good position to have the resources to, to make it a reality for a lot of students. But there's, there's a lot of financial need out there. And, you know, we have a limited budget. So there's only so much we can do to spread that. You know, we've got roughly a $40 million financial aid budget. And um, if there's any generous donors in the crowd, we can <laughs> talk afterwards. But you're getting at that key point, which we talked about, which is, you know, you need to make sure you have a range of people on the team, if you will, then figure out how you make the most of it. Other questions? I am Rachel Hathaway. I'm from the university here at the college. Oh. Um, I'm probably one of the few people that read your entire book. Uh, as a statistician, I loved it. The first one. The second one is much more um, readable to a layperson. And That's I love right. It. Someone but described the first book as an airplane book if you're flying to Singapore. <laughs> Which, uh, it's harsh. <laughs> right there on the floor. <laughs> This is Armando's. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, of course, I, uh, my colleagues in the little odd diversity orchestra group, because I just wrote this long paragraph of my issues with the statistics that were presented and how it was presented. Right. Yet, it's still it's out there. Right. How do we get your voice out there to lay people to understand, for colleges to understand, um, in a way that Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a great question. I think one of the things that is where I really moved on this issue is that when I first got in this space, I get super excited because you'd go to all these places and they had amazing web pages and memos and things like that. And then eventually you kind of realize this is so much more about practice, right? This is so much more. And so the thing I liked about Armando's piece, in fact, it was funny because I was emailing back and forth about something totally unrelated, um, the tour guide at RISD. <laughs> the, uh, and then I'm like, wait a minute, you just had this article. But the thing is, the article makes this amazing point that in these places, like you know, biomedical research, faculty jobs, that the it's the old metaphor of like you know, a certain set of people have designed the room, designed the house, and then said, okay, come in here and you know, be just like us. And I was just at you know, again, let's go back to the Google case. You know, Stanford had me, and I was talking to Stanford, and I said, you know. One of the issues that, that Stanford has and, and Google has and Facebook has is they can hire anybody they want for the most part and they can get who they want. And people from the South and lower income people get there and you know what? We don't like Brie. <laughs> we don't like Chardonnay. We don't wear Lycra in mountain bike and Pelotons and stuff. It just ain't all that. You know what I mean? And that's so why I said, who's had people over to their house in the last month? Who's drunk beer from a can? Who's had potato salad? Who's gone to church? And not a single hand was up. And I'm like, those are good things. <laughs> you know? Those are really good things. And the thing is, is I think that like, you, you have to think about, you know, when you, when you say this, again, this gets to this kind of achievement mindset as opposed to like creating spaces where everyone can excel, right? And I think the thing is, is that I know one of David's missions here, and I think you know, generally enlightened professors are saying, I want everyone to kind of be able to bring their whole selves to their place of work, their place of education, and really thrive and bring those differences to bear, right, so that we're just like a richer place, I mean, richer in terms of, you know, ideas and understandings. And I just think that, um, 
we're still caught up in this kind of meritocratic mindset, and people have this feeling that there's a trade-off. Yeah, there's this, right, this trade-off right. logic, and that's just, it's just not true. There is no trade-off, right? So Scalia famously said in the uh, court case, he said, you can be diverse or you can be excellent. But he actually didn't say excellent. He said super duper. He used the yeah. legal term. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. You know. And I would just add, before we get to this, I saw a student with his hand up, so I want to get the yeah. student next. But one of the things that I think Scott's doing a great job of is you know, a lot of us in the academy, we spend a lot of time talking to each other. Right. And um, we've got to get beyond each other. And so you know, if you look on YouTube, you see little videos that you know, are accessible. That's where Scott's talking. He's talking about all the different places where he's going, and he's engaging people who then will be in other conversations that we would never be in. And they're going to be influenced. So I think that's part of it as well. And I applaud you for getting out of the academy and talking to regular yeah. folks. But it's just one, one just amazing story that I did about this trust. We do trust. So I was at the CIA talking about this stuff and the need to get, like, if you're trying to understand terrorists, you don't want a whole bunch of people who went to Yale. No, I mean, you know, because, I mean, you don't want a whole bunch of no, you don't want people who, like, are, went to Yale and Michigan, you know, who grew up in wealthy families and, you know, totally safe environments. Because these are mostly people who've been, you know, people who become terrorists are people who feel disaffected, mm -hmm. right? And they were talking about the incredible, like, so when they found where bin Laden was, they built an exact mock-up of the place, and they practiced that thing 50 times. But one of the things where they cut costs, this is what government should never cut costs, instead of building thick walls, which the compound has, they use chain link, chain link fences to mimic the walls. Helicopter landed, helicopter landed, helicopter landed, perfect every, 20, every time. <laughs> when they get there, helicopter gets there, and there's nowhere where the wash to go. Right. And so the helicopter is going to go. And so the guy has to crash the copter, mm -hmm. right? The main people coming, he just has to crash it, hoping, trusting that the other people will figure out what to do because then that communications has gone and everything else. And it's just flat out pure trust from a diverse team, right? Which, you know, we need to sort of create in these places. But then it's also the case that, like, they talked about, they learned that they need a diverse team because if they'd had a single person who knew anything about aeronautic engineering, they wouldn't have built the chain link fence, <laughs> right? <laughs> So it was total, it was a, you know, they see that as a diversity failure, right? Is a student here? What's your name? Um, my name is Andrew I'm a sophomore on the basketball team with Verona, and we are one of four international students on our basketball team. So I've been here for a year now, and I've found it awesome. But um, my question is, being in, I would say, an, not an outsider, but without being an outsider from a different country, would you... Do you feel that, I've always learned that in history, that in the US history, that it was always known as the melting pot, that the US mm -hmm. came like together, and that was like the U American dream. So I feel, I was gonna ask, do you feel that other countries have now overtaken that with diversity, and that is the US still the pinnacle, or do you feel that you guys have slipped behind in other ways? Who wants to start? <laughs> Andy, it's you, you're the, he said history. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Cue it up. <laughs> well, I think, um, I mean, obviously, this is something that's been front and center for the, in, politically in the past couple of years with um, just the way that um, debates about immigration and refugees have, have been in our politics. Um, and, you know, for, for people, you know, like myself who, um, you know, are encouraged by the, the greater diversity in the United States, the, there is this common refrain. It's like you, you push back and we, you know, we're the melting pot. It's Emma, the Emma Lazarus poem on the bottom of the Statue of Liberty. Um, and that, you know, that, that is a, a real and genuine strain in, in American history. But it has always been in conversation with its antithesis. Um, you know, we have at the turn of the 20th century or 19th to 20th century, the huge surge of, of immigration of people from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, you know, Italy and Poland and you know, people who are Catholic, people who are Jewish, people Orthodox coming into a country that's primarily, you know, Protestant Christian. Um, and there's a huge pushback. I mean, immigration is essentially, for the most part, shut down in the 1920s. Um, and that slowly changes over the mid 20th century, but that, you know, that tension about diversity versus cultural homogeneity, about, you know, the sort of what's the core of this country really about is about agreeing on a certain set of principles or practices, 
or is it about you know welcoming all sorts of stuff in? I mean, that is that's just this intertwined thing. I, so I think we we like to and should celebrate that that melting pot story, but that other part, that resistance, that that the the discomfort or the concerns. You know, I don't want to mischaracterize people on the other side, but that is also a very real part of especially, you know, American history from the late 19th century on. And, um, you know, we're confronting that today. So, I mean, I think demographically, obviously, we're, the country's become so much more diverse, I mean, from where we were 50 years ago, from where we were 100 years ago, but that in itself is bringing these questions to the fore. And, um, you know, I think we have, we have the, the cultural and political tools to manage that, but it's not, you know, it's not set in stone. It's not guaranteed. Um, so. A quick add, I think, you know, I did notice you laughed, sociologists, but also mm -hmm. laughed because I know why. Um, when you talked about meritocracy, and part of it is about the paradigm. Right? I mean, part of what I think we're trying to do in, in the academy in general, in this space, I'd say social science, it pushes is really trying to help people understand the difference between the rhetoric and the reality. Um, as I like to, because I think in bike analogies a lot, cycling, is to try to help people understand is the wind at your back or the wind in your face? And you can't tell actually when you're riding, right? You can only tell when you turn around, but if you never turn around, you never know. And so part of what we do is to say, well, that actually wasn't all you, right? This melting pot, you didn't really there. The meritocracy, right. it wasn't all that. So I think that's part of what we're trying to do to help folks advance. And, and bringing it back to a, a black experience, it's never been a melting pot. If anything, black folk were the ones that were the fire that kept the whole country going, um, that fuel that kept it going, physically, economically, politically. So understanding a, a, a worldview from a, um, a diaspora or African diaspora stance gives you a window into seeing that Maybe some of these um, these myths that we have about who we are, that, that's something that makes us uncomfortable. If we even just unpack what the melting pot ideologies are mm -hmm. and knowing those stories, you, it makes us uncomfortable because we think that's our foundation, but it's not the foundation for everybody. Mm -hmm. And to realize that democracy is something that's constantly being challenged, right? And there is room for everyone, but there's been some strivings and struggles with that. And trying to comprehend that is from a historical perspective and, and the now, right? But we want to understand that in a constructive way that's respectful. I mean, one of the goals in my classrooms has always been, and even in my research as well, is to show the humanity of all experiences, right? And that there's not just one perspective. And we, we need to really learn how to respect each other. And a good avenue of doing that is telling your story, being authentic, saying where you're from, and understanding that we can do this together. We can work in a way that's a, a collective. And it's, it, but that doesn't demean you and your individual um, strengths and talents, but we can work together and that, that's for the better for all. Right. Yeah, one of the, I mean, putting your question, so when you, as a social scientist, one of the, if you pick up a political science textbook, if you pick up political theory, it's a great book by Jim Johnson and Jack Knight, they'll say the fundamental problem of politics is diversity, right? And if you pick up an economics book, they'll be, it's all about, Diversity, sociology is all about diversity. When we think about how as a society do we solve problems, there's famous books in the 1960s from a guy, um, Charles Lindbergh at Yale, who said, look, there's markets, there's hierarchies and democracies. And one of the big challenges, go to econ, they'll be like, markets work. Go to political science, they'll say, politics work, sort of. <laughs> go to business school, they'll talk about organizations working. But one of the deep questions is, where do you use each one? Well, now there's been a change, right? So now people would say, there's now five things, not three. In addition to those, there's just kind of like, self-organized stuff, stuff to, it's just like ecologies, right, that happen. And there's also algorithms, right? Like, so some stuff is now just done by like algorithms, sorting stuff out. And so then when you look and you say, are we, you know, where are we spectacular and where are we a train wreck? So music, we're spectacular. I mean, America is awesome, <laughs> right? Food, we're spectacular. Dance, we're spectacular. Art, we're spectacular. You know, so somehow in these cultural dimensions where we don't have politics are kind of getting <laughs> out of the way, we're doing pretty well. Infrastructure were horrible. Schools were horrible, right? I mean, you know, higher education were great, lower education were not, right? So there needs to be a discussion, I think, at sort of a more macro level in terms of what institutions, you know, here's the list of problems. 
here's our institutional tools, and why aren't, since these institutions were all in some sense constructed to help us deal with diver different types of diversity, is there a matching problem going on? You know, what, how do we do it? And this is where I think it's really fun to have these sort of conversations. Like, it would be a great conversation to have in the classroom. Let's look at the diversity we've got at Union College, even. Or let's look at the diversity we've got in Schenectady. Let's look at the diversity we've got in New York, America, the world, and then ask, how are we doing with this? Because it's a big box of Lego, lots of different colored crayons, whatever metaphor you want to use, right? And are you doing fun, cool, amazing stuff with that or not, right? But can I, are, I just think the international comparison too is important. And, yeah. and I mean, I would say America is falling behind in yeah. a lot of key categories, you know, in terms of mobility, the inequality gap, what's happening with health issues, pollution, you name it. So yeah, life expectancy, life expectancy, yeah. maternal yeah. mortality, I mean, all sorts of stuff. So, so we're, we're in the, uh, we're in the, uh, I was like soccer, we're in the extra time piece, That's right. <laughs> the speed round because the clock may run at any moment. So quick questions, quick answers. Jason, you're up first with the internet and then we're moving. Answer the your internet question. question. Online question, then you can have Char Carl, you're right after. Yes, we're streaming live and on Facebook Live we have, how do you encourage difficult conversations when there is pressure to learn material and get a good grade? And how can we break the notion that it's all about the grade and less about what we learn? Okay, so quick answers. What do we do about that? We'll talk to Lou about this, Jason. Yeah, this is all great, but I gotta get a grade. You, you take a chance as a professor to do that, but we have other constraints on us as well that are external to, to, for the grades, so, but for the student perspective, um, what, am, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that we can set up a framework of engaged work that the students will do, and we can say the grade doesn't matter, but it's very hard with the pressures that they're coming into to get into an institution here to kind of retool that, that perspective. They are, we, we work with some really driven students and motivated students. And they, they've, for 12 years, they've come here with the grades matter. We, we say the grades matter, but we want you to learn and take risks. So we set up lessons to do that. It's, do you buy in? I mean, this is almost mission impossible sometimes. Sometimes. So we want you to engage in this as well. So um, I'm, I'm saying, we, I think the faculty, we do set it up that you can do your projects, do your work, learn the material, take risks. We just want your buy-in, right? We just want you to take the ride with us. So, Carl? Uh, lovingly, I'm disappointed with all seven of you. <laughs> Not once in any remark did I hear the word truth, good, honor, beauty, justice, and so on and on. And Plato would be very disappointed with us and you. This building is devoted to those issues. But diversity, in my opinion, is a tool to achieve these great elements of the good. And I wonder why. Not one of you thought about justice, good government, truth, honor in your presentations. Because I think that are, those are some of the primary objectives that we as an academic community must have. And without those, we're in trouble. Thank you. I loved your presentation. I think your point, Dr. Harris, about don't go outside and say the things that I should have said here. So I've said them. Thank you for that guy. <laughs> Thank you. And I was just, so no, but I, with all due respect, though, I think that, you know, I think a, a central part of my argument was that this, the diversity, you know, my comments about the Justice Department were that um, we need a more diverse set of people to actually get at truth and justice. And a lot of the stuff, in, and my comments about art, that you do get more beautiful things. And I think that the, the scientific evidence is that we're much better at getting at the truth. And, and your comments as well, I mean, I think, you know, our understanding of history is much truer and more accurate and more in the spirit of what, you know, Plato would desire because of the fact that we've brought different voices and different perspectives into the room. But I mean, so it might be that we didn't use those exact words, but certainly I, I hope it wasn't perceived as not being an important subtext of what... Uh, it's part of what drives. I think it's important yeah. to have the other part as well, though, I would argue. Because you only get so far if you only argue on those pieces. 
yeah. he ends up in rooms with different conversations. No, but just to, not to not to monopolize this, but if this is if efforts for diversity are framed entirely in terms of social justice, like it's the right thing to do, the moral thing to do, and not framed in terms of the things you just mentioned, that it's gonna allow us to live better lives, to create better lives for others, and to create a better world, it's a tough sell, right? And, but if it's framed in the way that, that we've been trying to frame it here because there's evidence for this, and if you think through the logic of it, it's just true, um, then I think that you know, puts the wind in your sails. And so the reason that I call my most recent book The Diversity Bonus is because the evidence is that it makes us better at all those things. And I actually end it with a basketball analogy because like in, when they passed the three-point line, the NBA put a three-point line in, there was a bonus there. It was sort of 50% more, right? Three is 50% more than two. The 83 Lakers, one of the greatest teams of all time, Magic Johnson, James Worthy, they made 13 three-pointers for the year because they couldn't know how to make them, right? Stephon Curry makes that in a day. <laughs> Why? Practice. And so what is David trying to do here? What are you trying to do with these Kelly Chambers? Practice. What are you trying to do in your class? What are you trying to do in your class? What are you trying to do with these people in the community? Practice, practice, practice. Right. Oh, two quick ones, last at the end. Zach? I actually had a comment. Um, when um, the uh, I'm a fourth year student here right. at right. Union College, and um, I've been here for four years, so I've seen students, I've interacted with students and professors. And one thing, we talk about, we talk about diversity and some of the challenges we face, but there's one program that I, and I'm on campus, I go around, we see pockets of students, whites together, blacks together, sometimes we mix, but not often. And then one opportunity that I attended was a social retreat. And then she said, um, uh, Miss, uh, Laurie, uh, yeah. She said, um, we have the Minerva program and we are trying to diversify students, but then it seems not to be working as we want it to. But then I went to the social retreat and it was a program that actually got me to interact with people in a way that I had never gotten an opportunity to. It was a, pro a program that allowed us to see us for who we are, not just our skin, not just the clothes we wear, not just the, our majors, but for what we are. So we talk about, um, situations where we find that we have similarities. And although we have differences, we have similarities. And that allows us to see uh, uh, others in a different light. So maybe in the future, if you could connect with one another and then mm -hmm. create a program that allows all students to mingle and see each other as humans, then maybe there's, yeah. So that was just a comment. It's a really important ben. point. Thank you. <laughs> and last, last question. You get the pressure of picking the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Lewis, and I've, um, I've been on the school board here in Schenectady for nine years and president of the school board in Schenectady. Schenectady is the largest, most diverse upstate school district in, uh, the, in the, as I said, in the upstate area, it's the largest, most diverse area. We have about 10,000 students. Our diversity is approximately 25, 30% Caucasian, 35% African American, and another 35% children of um, other uh, colors. Uh, uh, we have a large Guyanese population here in Schenectady. My challenge to the academic world is to invite many of these children to this campus mm -hmm. in, in situations, whether it be sports activities or some other, there is a small involvement with a program called My Brother's Keeper mm -hmm. that has helped some of our students. We struggle, as most urban districts, with reading uh, and mathematical literacy. And you're sitting here smack in the middle of the city. And we need to break down those barriers and work on that aspect. We have very few faculty members who actually live in the city of Schenectady. And that's one aspect of, of things that I think could help change. I invite um, students to become involved with organizations that here study what the city school district is doing. We've been looking at diversity at least the last six years that I'm aware of and in terms of disproportionality, in terms of diversion studies for um, uh, suspensions and, and how to handle those in a, in a better way to keep kids in school, and to become involved with the youth in, youth in Schenectady. I've heard from many international students of color here. I haven't heard from very many 
Native American, is that the way to put it? But people who were born in the United States, um, people of color. And I think that's an important thing. A few years ago, we had seven students come out of Schenectady High School to Union College. As I said, we're probably one of the most diverse school districts anywhere in the upstate region. And so I, to Jim's question, um, become involved with the local community. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And a good place to close. Thanks. So um, I told you that one of my, my uh, indicators of success is that people say in the room what they might otherwise say outside the room. And I think you'd see with Carl's question, it allowed us to have that conversation. Two other indicators, the number of people whose eyes are open and their heads are up at 8.40 in the evening, as well as the number of people who I did not see the glare of your cell phone on your face during the talk. So with that, I'm going to say this was successful, and it goes to our panelists and to our audience in the engagement. So I want to thank all of you for being part of this up here and all of you in the audience. And now we have some refreshments and plenty of more time to engage constructively. Thanks, folks. Well done, well done.